Hey, welcome to the show. It's a liquid lunch, a special liquid lunch, June the 5th, 2014. And uh, we got a really special show tonight, Sandra. We do. I'm so excited. And uh, so this is Sandra. She's my co-host, in case people are watching that haven't been here before. Yep. I'm Hugh. And uh, we've got uh, Chris Rusak and Eliza Nakwa joining us from the uh, Modern Knowledge Tour 2014 that's going across the country. And uh, we've got some big guests coming on the show that you guys are taking across the country. Yes. Right, yes, Chris? Yes. Um, so we got, uh, maybe you want to say who yeah, we got uh, coming on the show all, today. Thank you very much for having us on uh, this evening. I know it's a, it's a special you guys are doing, and thank you for welcoming welcoming us into your studio. It's Again, because you were here, Chris, before you launched the tour, yeah. and and now it's you're almost, what, you're two-thirds of the way basically, through the tour? Yeah, I can't believe we're actually on the road and doing this, and we got six, basically we're traveling from Halifax, Nova Scotia, to Vancouver, British Columbia, in a span of about three and a half weeks. So and you are living a rock star life. You look like yeah, a rock star. It's like right from the 70s. You were so clean you know? before, and now what happened? <laughs> no, actually, I love this new Chris. I'm growing the hockey beard, though. I'm growing the tour beard. I'll shave this off. You're going to see me in Vancouver. It's going to be about this long. Plus, you're picking up girls on the road. I know. Like no, Eliza no. here, you stopped in PEI and added somebody to the bus. That was a hard right? one to pull over my wife. Like, honey, oh. you that girl's voice you hear in the background. Yeah, but it's just a tape recorder. <laughs> it's just, no, she was an easy sell. But, yeah, in, in about three and a half weeks, we're going to go coast to coast. Um, we're hitting 12 cities along the way. And joining us... Um, in each city are three special speakers. So riding in the RV with us is mm -hmm. Michael Tellinger from South Africa and Richard Dolan from Rochester, New York. Both of them have their own special little unique research um, platforms or mm -hmm. projects that they put forward and you're gonna meet them later tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an honor and a privilege to ride with these two fellows. Like the, the conversations we're having uh, on the road. And, and I understand that you have the, the behind the scenes things happening too. I yes. can only imagine the kinds of stories you're, yes. you're, you're yeah, kind yeah. of drumming up. Well, mm -hmm. Eliza, you must have, I mean, I don't know how this kind of came about because you weren't part of the plan, right? The original plan and kind of things, one thing led to another and away we go. So what's this like for you? It's profound. It's amazing. It's, it's blowing my mind in so many ways and in a good way, right? It's brought so much grounding to, to my life experience this far. And I've been following their work, you know, for a while. Uh, my friend Kat McKernan introduced me to their work and um, she also purchased my tickets to attend the Charlottetown show. And now I'm a part of this tour. Wow. And it's that's profound. Amazing. It's really profound. It's, it's definitely, um, a meant to be scenario, you know. Well, you know what? I just just my own little story about this. I first heard about Michael Tellinger like a couple of years ago. Somebody gave me a disc of yes. a lecture that he gave, and said this guy is amazing. And I listened to it, and, and I was thrilled. And I thought, boy, I would really love to interview this guy someday. But he's in South Africa. I mean, and then Chris, you showed up, and the next thing you know, Michael <laughs> Tellinger's walking in the door. Yes, right. Isn't yes. that awesome? Look at how powerful you are. You created that. Well, and that's that's the essence of what's happening on this tour. Um, yeah. Starting in Halifax, literally, we didn't know what we're going into there. Mm -hmm. And I'll be the first to admit, there's we're dealing with a lot of alternative subject matter, mm -hmm. um, and that mm -hmm. subject matter is not widely discussed in the mainstream media, which is one reason why we wanted to bring this tour on the road, make it kind of a an event bigger than the information itself, just to just to connect with people on the ground in Canada. And Halifax was amazing. We had we had a, a decent turnout, but the people that turned out there were mm. disconnected from one another. Mm. And what we found is the tour itself brought them together wow. for the first time oh. in a city that they have no groups that deal with this type of matter. They don't have radio coverage. Uh, Coast to Coast is a very popular late night mm -hmm. radio show. I think it's one of the highest rated radio shows in the world. But East of Montreal, there's no affiliate radio stations that cover that. Wow. So, you know, the, the late night, no, late owl, uh, night owl, or the truck driver, or what have you, the cabbie, that listens to this information. Mm. Once you start entertaining the thoughts that we're trying to put out there, and they're just thoughts, they're ideas. We, we want people to make up their own minds. Mm -hmm. But out on the East Coast, these people, from one way or another, through social media and through the internet, stumbled upon these researchers. And just the energy in the room mm. in, in Halifax was amazing. And, you know, it, it's, it made me smile at the end. Everybody's giving each other hugs and kisses and Aww. exchanging emails and setting up meetup groups and 
uh, vowing that, you know, we're going to get together and we're going to create our own event next year mm -hmm. here. So it's just, it's wow, that dynamic. It's that amazing. infusion of energy that this tour is, seems to be bringing well, to a lot I of the... Yeah, I mean, I just got to say, you got a great crowd here yeah. today, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's an amazing event that yeah. we're having. We got a whole bunch of people in the other room. In fact, I don't know if they're hearing us because they're obviously so making a little bit of noise on their own. Yeah, uh, yeah but we want to go in and <laughs> interview them too. Well, we've already had, I've already met some great, so many great yeah. people, yeah. and uh, already having so much fun here tonight. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of unique people here, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, but you're also doing this, we can't forget, we have to mention Dave, yes. because Dave's your partner in yes. crime in this, and yes. the two of you are, are really pioneers, and, you know, I just, kudos to you guys, because this is the first tour of its kind, right? This is the first, I mean, it, it's it's almost insane when you think about it, and I'm sure there have been moments that you thought, wow, when you've gotten up in that RV in the morning, thought, what am I doing? Yes. Like, have you had those moments? Oh, yeah totally have though every moment we, we wake up in the <laughs> rv uh something something's gone wrong in the middle of the night there's you know someone forgot to do something or someone left something something out and you know so we're, basically we're trying to camp as much as we can yeah. and try to get that whole campfire canadian content in there we're right. all we know we're bringing along we have a, a young student from humber college matt allen he's the lead singer for the ancient order oh, really right. cool alternative thought type of rock band all the lyrics are all about what we're doing so what better person he's a journalist student here's a gopro camera here's a couple other cameras here's some wireless mics so he's documenting our adventure mm -hmm. as well as we go along and it's just you know the, those campfire conversations with and you'll meet them later michael and rich and and linda those campfire conversations are priceless like it's just that's when total energy comes out when you're in that nice intimate setting, I, I so, suppose yeah. that's when you know what you're really what you're doing is is really worth yeah. it. That's yeah. when those moments, it's like, wow, all of this was worth it because I know this has been so so much work for you guys. Yeah. It's been it's a huge. You've taken on a huge huge challenge here. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's, it's one of those things. And and Michael Tellinger will talk about this later with his Ubuntu movement mm -hmm. and Ubuntu contributionism. Mm -hmm. When you work for your passion, you don't consider yes, it work. Yeah. So that's the number one, you know, starting point when it comes to that type of philosophy and that type of paradigm shift. And I'm just curious, uh, Chris, like what really, what is it, what was it that really got you uh, motivated to pull this tour off? Mm. It was, again, I think it boils down to um, the future thought of connecting people together in a, in a, in a manner that is in a physical form. It's mm -hmm. one thing to go on the internet and to like and to share and to chat and to text, but getting people together in a room, there's something that has to be said for that. And our world is slowly getting away from mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. because social media is much more convenient. But getting together, a lot of people email me, why should I come to the event when I can just see all these guys talking about the same stuff mm -hmm. online? Yeah. It's not the case. Because mm -hmm. you get into their presence and a lot, of our, a lot of our events, we're doing workshops afterwards. So we're, it started off as a physical presentation, but it's kind of morphed into basically it's a sharing circle, mm -hmm. right? So people that like the work of Richard Dolan or like the work of Michael Tellinger or Kerry Cassidy, they can sit in a circle and not only are they exchanging information with the speaker that they've heard on the radio or on TV, but they're also sharing it with each other because the people that are supposed to be in that circle are in that circle for a reason yes. and they're yes. learning off each other. And that's something you can't get in a in a in a digital format online right. yeah uh, absolutely but you know i think i think social media has its place but really what i see facebook um where i see the value in something like facebook is to organize meetings yes. to get together yeah. not to be the meeting right right it's not it's not supposed to replace the yeah. engagement it's supposed to just help you organize it yeah. that's i think where you know where facebook really has its value and yeah. Yeah. Now, Eliza, we haven't uh, heard too much from you, but you joined the tour, and you're, you've been in the film industry for a long time. Yes. I mean, what was it about this that, I mean, you got the ticket in Charlottetown, and now you, here you are on the bus in Toronto, <laughs> on the way out west. What was it that really uh, interested you about uh, climbing on board? Uh, well, I was a federal and provincial candidate in the Green Party. I've, I've had my congratulations on that. Into, That's amazing. Into politics, and when I learned more about the Ubuntu Party and Michael Tellinger's work, it really resonated with me. Um, with Rich Dolan, my mother has fascinating story, and it, and she had an opportunity to come with me 
to their show. So it was very complimentary to, to why we went. Wow. There was a purpose there. And it was a great uh, experience for my mother, who's 67, um, a survivor of many things. And she had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Richard Dolan, and he wow. listened to her story. So they had an intimate moment there of sharing, and it was really great for her. It was very empowering, and that was our main interest for ourselves. And also I wanted to welcome Michael Tellinger and, and the whole Modern Knowledge Tour. I wanted to gift them with, a, with the tobacco, the sacred tobacco of our people, the Mi'kmaq, and welcome them to our territory. And so I asked, actually it was you, Chris, that I pulled aside and asked if I could have a moment to welcome them yeah. uh, to Mi'kma'ki, to Prince Edward Island, Abigwet, and to set them on their journey in, in a good way on this land. Wow. And they allowed me that time. And I was able to gift Michael and the group with tobacco and a PEI stone with a sacred symbol on it from our people. Wow. That's just... And that sacred symbol was one of our <laughs> crazy nights, right? Yes. Yes, going into that. Cause it's just, just part of that behind-the-scenes video camera. It is. That it's yes. actually part there of it. There will be... We had a couple of You guys are going to be selling this, So too. I don't know if it'll go to air, but... <laughs> I can't believe you guys are drinking no. beer on such a journey. <laughs> well, there's... And, 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 of course, the Tim Hortons coffees, yes. right? Of course. Yes. There's Everybody the morning <laughs> drink and then the evening <laughs> drink. So. so what is really cool uh, about the tour and um, about tonight is, is the guests we have because some amazing topics. We, we touched upon Michael and, and Ubuntu. We're going to be talking about contributionism. But we've also got uh, Linda Moulton Howe. Yes. We've got Richard Dolan. And they're going to be talking about something that's uh, very different. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, about their work? Well, yeah. yeah. And, and so Well, a, yeah, basically uh, uh, Linda Moulton Howe and Richard Dolan um, – they both dabble, well, Richard more so than Linda, but they both dabble in the topics of ET contact, extraterrestrial visitation, abduction, basically that whole phenomenon. Ufology. Ufology, yeah, uh, for a broad term, yeah. So um, Linda's work in the past, um, she runs an awesome website, earthfiles.com. So she deals, mm -hmm. she's basically hardcore fact researcher, old school. Mm -hmm. She does her homework. Mm -hmm. Everything that comes out of that woman's mouth, she's put in a lot of time mm -hmm. and uh, so her work is rock solid and it's just I love talking to Linda and it was just funny picking her up from the airport just right away get into a conversation in the car and it was like the most mind-blowing conversation ever because mm -hmm. she she's done the homework to the point where that the, the stuff that she'll she'll explain to you guys you'll think is like totally unreal this cannot happen mm -hmm. but then she has fact to back it all up and it's just like it makes you take a, a step back in your seat going okay i got to rethink of what i know here mm -hmm. right and it's just coming from she's a very empowering woman a very strong woman a uh, very determined woman and uh, well i think you, like you'd that, have right? to be to to cover the topic yeah. that she covers in mm -hmm. such detail yes. and she's i i mean i've heard her her interviews and she is she is like a walking encyclopedia yes. just really yes. and <laughs> i just don't even know how you, how she keeps all that information in her head yeah. honestly yeah. and then remembers it to actually talk about it it's <laughs> phenomenal to me it's just phenomenal so it is a bit mind blowing yeah, yeah. <laughs> to and listen to her and then rich is rich is basically he's a, a, a ufology historian so he's basically taken every single event that has happened that has affected both uh, humanity and uh, from a subconscious, a psychological level, but also mixes in a lot of the, the data from uh, United States and Canadian archives, brought mm -hmm. that all together under one umbrella in uh, a couple of series of, mm -hmm. of books that he has written, a chronology of ufology. So I'll let him get more okay. into that when you have him on. Okay. But he's, he's a fact guy as well and just he'll blow your mind with the information he provides. Okay, so let's just, uh, before we uh, take a little break and get these guys on, um, you've got some events happening in Toronto yes. this weekend because yes. it's only Thursday night. Do you want to just uh, yep. uh, give the details of what's happening in Toronto? So tomorrow morning at the Ontario Science Centre, uh, people can uh, buy tickets online at modernknowledge2014.com or they can come. We have registration between 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Richard Dolan's our first speaker. He starts at 9 and it's being held at the Ontario Science Center. All right. And then you have, so the, what, who else do you have? You have Richard Dolan. Richard Dolan, Michael Tellinger, and Linda Moulton Howe will okay. be providing uh, lectures tomorrow during the day. Is and there any 
Yeah. Sorry, and there's workshops afterwards. So after the three speakers go on during the day, we're going to break at about four o'clock, split them off into individual rooms, and yeah. that's where those sharing circles occur. Okay, great. Wow, that's and anything great. Anything else over this weekend in Toronto? Or are you no, that's it. We're going to actually, we're packing up and we're going to try to head as far out of town as possible. Not that we don't love Toronto, yeah. but we got a 17 hour drive to Thunder Bay ahead of us, and we have to be there bright and early for Sunday morning to Whoa. do a Thunder Bay event. Wow. So that's yeah. Cool. So be. so who's doing the driving here? So far I've driven every kilometer. What? Yeah. Are no you taking a bus? Way. Like, are you taking the the ferry to Manitoulin or are you going around? We're not going through Manitoulin. We'd okay. love to. Yeah. Oh yeah, that would but be that's, so nice. That's not what Mrs. GPS is telling us to do in order oh. to get get there. We're <sighs> actually on our way up in uh, Sault Ste. Marie, we're picking up Kevin Najwan and he's a First Nations We've had yes. him on the show. Yes. Like We're uh, picking him a couple up. of months ago. Yeah. He's our he's our keynote speaker in Thunder Bay and he'll be doing a sharing circle of sacred fire ceremony. Yeah. And Kevin's me and him have hit it off ever since the first day I met him. Yeah, yeah. And he's totally pumped. Is that where you met him here? Or uh, I did not no? meet him here. I, think you met, him yeah. through, I met him through Nikki. Through okay. Nikki. Yes. All right. Yes. Small so, world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right, guys. So modern knowledge. Uh, I told you the rock star. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're, so we're going to take a little break now. And uh, thank you, guys. And we're going to come back with Linda Moulton Howe and Richard Dolan. Yes. We're going to talk ufology. Exactly. So we'll be right you're back.
Okay, welcome back to the show here. We did a little tactical uh, shuffling of the cards. and Hopefully they can hear us in the uh, room, the uh, hundreds of people that have made it here tonight as part of the no Modern Knowledge Tour 2014. And now we've got uh, Linda Moulton Howe and Richard Dolan joining us. Hello. And maybe I heard, guys, that maybe this is the first time you guys have been on an together. interview together. Have we? I don't think we ever have been on an interview together. I don't, I don't know. Because I mean, you guys know each other really oh, yeah, very we've well known for each many other years. for a long time. But no, I don't, I don't I think don't we've think done a live thing together. <laughs> All right. Isn't that amazing? Is Linda is one of my see, favorite people in the entire world. And it's so funny because in I'm Canada, I, you are both from the States, and in Canada, we have to go to the States for these kinds of things to happen. And you came to Canada to be together. This is the first time yeah. you guys are, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, I think when we're at conferences, which is normally where our lives would cross, he does his speech, I do mine. If there are workshops, everything is always going on like a constant it's moving Rubik thing. Yeah. And so it's, we have to fight to get time to sit down and actually talk at conferences. They're hectic. Well, that, I mean, I guess this is a really good sign, though, because that means what you guys are doing, which is so out there by some people's standards, but it's really, really growing. You, if you are so busy with what you're doing. This must be, I mean, and you guys have been doing this for so long. This must be just so gratifying for you to see how, how much it's growing. I don't think it's out there because I've always been a mainstream journalist. I'm a producer, writer, director, editor and investigative reporter and my beat has always been science medicine and the environment that's what i i graduated from stanford university i uh, produced films for them in the stanford medical center uh, wow. my master's thesis was on the stanford linear accelerators first efforts to get computers to analyze the uh, atomic bombardment particles and so it was this background of always being in the hard-nosed science that when I was director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver and I started work there in 1978, they, the, everything I was doing was science, medicine, and the environment. And one of the stories in Colorado and here in Canada in almost every province back then wow were the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. And I had one of the most interesting conversations with your investigator for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Calgary. And he had seen the documentary I did, A Strange Harvest, and I had never talked to him. He called me at the station, and he had gotten a copy of the program, which is about mutilated animals and some law enforcement saying the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. This is not the reporter saying this. Mm -hmm. This is law enforcement. And when Lynn Lauber, who was head of the mutilation investigation in Calgary for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, called me, and he said, I've seen your film, and I just want you to know it's everything that we're investigating. And I said, sir, then why? are you putting out headlines throughout Canada that's picked up in the United States that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are focusing on a cult, a satanic cult named O, the letter O. A book had been written about this back in the 70s. Mm. Literally, this was his answer to me, because we have to get the public and the media off our back. And I said then, you've seen my documentary, and you know that law enforcement is telling me that the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. And he said to me on the phone, this is not on camera, I would agree. That is the background to the animal mutilations. That is the background to why if you are a producer, writer, director, editor, and your beat is science, environment, and medicine, and you get yourself buried into all the work it takes 18 hours a day to try to get to the bottom of animal <coughs> mutilations, and this is what you're being told by law enforcement. And then you realize that from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Canada to sheriff's offices, police offices, attorney general's offices in the United States, everybody is not telling the truth because somehow the fix is in. 
It will not be politically correct for your career if you investigate the animal mutilations that are linked to extraterrestrials. And so I here today, because 35 years, mm -hmm. I have simply been trying to build the solid, hard brick evidence that supports what those sheriffs told me back in 79 and what Lynn Lauber in Calgary told me on the phone. The perpetrators of animal mutilations are creatures from outer space. And how can you go through that and not want to know who, what, why, what does the Canadian government, the American government, the Chinese government, all the governments, what do they know? And why is there a policy of denial to the taxpayers around the world mm -hmm. on something as fundamental as we're not alone in the universe? And my colleague, uh, Rich Dolan, has gone into the history about what is the foundation for such a policy of denial that would persist from World War II to this day? And you and I know how many layers of lies. Yeah. Exactly. I love what you said. I want to answer your question, okay. which is, I can't even remember now, but you talked about is like why are people, are there more people interested in this now? It's growing. I, think I would have thought. How, how did we get into this? Well, and we growing got into momentum. It in a very compatible way. We both came in through what we f was a mainstream prism. But I will say, I've only been involved in this now researching 20 years, 20, maybe 21 years. And I have noticed a definite cultural sea change from my part. And that's why I think we're so busy. It's insane in terms of the amount of activity right. that both of us are engaged in that's because right. there is. There is a profound hunger for knowledge that people have. And they know that in their everyday life they're being lied to about the whole structure of what their reality is supposed to be. They know this. Even if they, they don't know it in their heads, they know it in their bones, that there's something very de desperately wrong about the construct of their reality. And uh, so they're searching for altern literally alternative news. And uh, that, whole, that whole field has grown exponentially in the last 20 years. I mean, more than 20 years ago, there was, there was no internet. There was no true m wide outlet for this type of research. The MUFON Journal would have maybe 2,000 copies, you know, very limited stuff. But now it's, it's the potentials for millions and millions of people to ex uh, uh, be involved and in to get this information. And guess what? They're into it. And that includes conferences, that includes events like uh, this modern knowledge tour that we're doing going across Canada in an RV, meeting people <laughs> across this country and discovering that there is a tremendous desire, I hear them clapping in there, yes. uh, for this kind of information. So there's, there's um, a, as Linda was saying, there's um, this huge disconnect between this massive reality that's obviously here, that's obviously important, that is being, and, and the fact that it's being denied by all of the official powers that be. And but, but one, people know there's a problem with it. One of the things that goes right to the heart of what's happening now is more and more whistleblowers. Yeah. I don't think in the last, <coughs> well, if, if I got into this 35 years ago, it's just been in about since around 2007. There has been an uptick, and it seems to keep growing, and I have more. We're talking about substantive people who have worked on the back engineering of extraterrestrial technology and are prepared to say that. And the Corso, Lieutenant mm -hmm. Philip J. Yeah. Corso, mm -hmm. uh, a man who NBC embarrassed, and they had no right to, his background was incredible. He worked with General Arthur Trudeau in the Pentagon. Yeah. The, the story of Lieutenant Philip J. Corso was the truth about the United States government in collaboration, I'm sure, with the World War II, we'll call them allies of Canada, England, the Uni uh, <coughs> New Zealand, and Australia. But in the United States, it was Philip J. Corso's own firsthand testimony that he was being handed in the Pentagon extraterrestrial technology defined as such. 
and taking it to, let's say, one person, let's pick Corning Glass, mm -hmm. could have been a, a, any corporation that they needed to analyze. He has a one-on-one -on -one connection through the Pentagon. It is handed over. No one in Corning Glass knows that it's extraterrestrial. And Philip J. Corso, in detail, dis defines and describes he was the guy taking this material to these different corporations under the highest levels of government. General Trudeau was appointed by General uh, Eisenhower, who became president, and they knew each other from the war. And uh, President Eisenhower says to Trudeau, I want you to be our first research, uh, science and research director in the Pentagon because, as I understand it, Rich, he was the only Army general ever to this day who had a PhD. Arthur Trudeau? General Arthur Trudeau mm -hmm. was a PhD in engineering. And Eisenhower bonded with him when they were in World War II, trusted him, and that's why he handpicked. Yeah. Trudeau knew Corso yeah. from the Italian campaign, and men in war, or men and women, the they go to the people they trust. Of course. Of course, of course. That book, that man, deserves to be on everybody's reading list around the world, and yet, when this man, he was dead only eight months after the book came out, when he was interviewed in an NBC program, the, we'll call them the so-called host investigator, they used a part in where uh, Lieutenant Colonel Corso said that they knew they were dealing with time and I think he said something about timelines, which implied time travel. Right, right. And yeah. when NBC ran that program, the this way— This during the 50th anniversary of Roswell, it was I the, believe. The that. program came later after that, but it was in that same milieu with mm -hmm. the built book. For those of us in television, you know that you can produce anything, edit anything to make a person look great or not. And the way, when I saw it, I saw the first broadcast. And it was enraging because it was a hatchet piece to a man who had served in our military in an extremely important capacity by uh, people who in families knew that Corso and Trudeau, Trudeau knew each other very well. And why? Somebody in our government, I think, did not want the back engineering to come out, let alone the possibility of time travelers. So they have fixes in all the media so that, and I don't know if it goes on in Canada, but I know it does in the United States. There are controllers. Mm -hmm. They won't be called that. They'll be called uh, executive producer yeah. of. <laughs> I, I just want to jump in very quickly. Go. So first of all, um, <clears throat> I think you're exactly right about 2007-ish being the jumping off point for the uh, whistleblower explosion. Um, and there's a very clear reason for that, in my opinion, which is that we've, around that time is when we developed a global infrastructure to accommodate whistleblowers. There was no WikiLeaks 10 years ago because we didn't have a global infrastructure to accommodate an organization grabbing digital data and throwing it out there. But now we have that infrastructure and behold, here's WikiLeaks. It's like if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. Same for whistleblowers. We didn't have uh, YouTube prior to 2005. There was no YouTube. There was some video, but it wasn't, wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You start getting an infrastructure in place where people have a forum where they can talk. So all of this is a symptom that our whole civilization is going through this dramatic transformation right now. It's all based on uh, revolutions in technology, which means revolutions in communication, which means that people now can, can have a way to, to, uh, to tell their story. And by the way, regarding Corso, uh, I, I agree with you on Corso uh, completely. And uh, it's nice to remember that when he first wrote his book, he got his uh, forward by U.S. Senator Strom Thurmond, right. who I think was about 180 at the time <laughs> he wrote it. Um, I actually, when, when Thurmond, he wrote this ringing endorsement of, of Corso's book because he knew him. Corso had had a tremendous amount 
of prestige and respect in his position. He was a, a Senate liaison, he was an assistant to Thurmond for uh, military matters. Thurmond loved him. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't know what the book was explicitly about, but he respected Corso and said, you know, this, is, this man is an American hero. When uh, the book came out and the media frenzy took place on Corso, the, the press all descended on Strom Thurmond, and he had to say basically, I don't know nothing about no UFOs, right. and then they pulled his forward. But wow. this was Corso. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing about Corso is, you know, he really, he kind of wrote his book and he kind of didn't write his book. So it was all on deadline. Uh, William Burns, Bill Burns of UFO Mag, really wrote that together. Factual errors galore made it very easy to pick that book apart by skeptics who said, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong. Although the fundamentals of what Corso said, uh, I've always felt were very logical. And everyone who knew Corso, a lot of people interviewed him, and they, everyone, I'm not aware of any one person who said he's full of it. No. Is it, is it worth getting the book? Oh, from any, yes, because the day after Roswell. Yeah. Well, the day after Roswell, yeah. so it's worth, so it's interesting that they, they can't put a stop to that. They can put a stop to the, you know, the media and, all, and he's no longer here. But well, they tried the making book. him look like a fool, as Linda That's said. Right. That's exactly right. And there's always been, and there are controllers in, in the media, in Canadian too, it's the same. Of course U.S. Is. media is, is, has been so tightly controlled for so long. There's uh, a, there's a joke, you know. um, where we have a major station called CBC, Canadian Broadcast, uh, yeah. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The public broadcaster. Uh, well, and we say controlled by Canada. That's what we <laughs> oh, <laughs> pretty yeah. much say that's, uh, I've done animal rights for many years and they would always say, oh, nobody showed up at these protests and I would be there and there were thousands of people. So we, it was a, just a joke amongst our, our Well, the bottom line. Should CBB controlled by the Bilderbergers? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably be more apropos, but anyway. The bottom line is that Corso was saying that he was the one who took extraterrestrial technology from an office in the Pentagon, from a General Trudeau, who was a close friend of the President of the United States, don't forget that, mm -hmm. and was hand delivering into corporations to back engineer. And one of the most powerful of the leaks that was in 2007 comes from a man who said that he worked in a Palo Alto laboratory also trying to back engineer, leaked a document that is commercial application research for extraterrestrial technology, CARAT is the acronym. Mm. And the whole idea, he said, was that the Department of Defense in the United States was frustrated by the slowness of their government contractors. They're trying to back engineer extraterrestrial technology without anybody in the world knowing that they have it, and they want to get it patented and copyrighted in all of the various legal issues in the United States to keep it out of the hands of other nations. Mm -hmm. That's their mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. And because the process was so slow, the whistleblower was a scientist said about 200 scientists of varying types were brought together and told that they, this was a program, the Department of Defense would be in charge, but they wanted them to be in Palo Alto in the 1980s in a mix where what we now call today the computer world that became Apple and everything. They wanted to see if a bunch of scientists with extraterrestrial technology could literally back engineer and accelerate this process. And he said, the thing about it, I, I got to communicate with him privately, this man. He said, when you come to work and they have been telling you that they want you to feel like you're completely the scientist that you are, but they have submachine guns in the room. Mm. Right there is the metaphor of the last 60 years, of our government certainly trying to go like this on anything related to extraterrestrial, needing scientists, the best scientists that there are. And how do you put those two together when they are antithetical? And there are so many stories of people being given offers of tremendous amounts of money to go underground and that what has been taking place underground 
probably in Canada as well as the United States, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, that if we could lift up the surface of this planet, what would be revealed would probably Absolutely. shock all of us. Absolutely. Now, I, I have a question. I'm going to, okay, so there's a whole other theory about UFOs, right? So what you guys are saying is that they're extraterrestrials, they come from off planet. There's a whole other theory that flying saucers were developed in Germany during the Second World War and, uh, and that the stories of them being from extraterrestrial origins really only came out after, this, after the Second World War and, and, but without any actual proof that these craft come from off planet. I can give I, you one right, opening context. You, yeah, it, because where you need to frame this is actually before World War II. There was a book, uh, I've seen it, I've read it, and uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was called The New Science or The New World Coming, but it was in the teens, was written around 1917, and it was about a ongoing effort by certain groups in Germany who were talking about how that there were forces among them in which there was going to be a change in the world and that tall, blonde, blue-eyed, white-skinned super beings would become the dominant population of the planet. This is what the book is about. And that when Hitler began rising to power, uh, I have talked with a man who read the document I'm going to describe to you. He worked in army uh, cryptoanalysis in a southeastern uh, army base, but his check came from the CIA in Langley. Mm -hmm. And he was in Langley, and there's a basement archive. It's separate from Suitland, Maryland, which uh, lots of intel stuff. This is a, a Langley archive that is underground. It's quite large. And they were going down there because his boss was looking for something very specific about disks because they were both assigned to work in a Project Blue Book, nothing like the phony Blue Book that was paraded for the media mm -hmm. and pub it was silly. No, this was the real Project Blue Book and it was being handled through Fort Belvoir in Virginia. And it was going to the CIA, the CIA had units that were working going all around the world where there were reports of disks and beings. This is where this guy worked. And he said, they were looking for specific information on a specific shape, the shape of craft, are indicators to the government of certain types. They're down there, they get a folder, and inside is a document that was written in 1927. And it was from an intel group in England to, and Rich and I, you've, you've uh, tried to tell me it was, I don't even know if it was the OSS in 1927. No. It's whatever the precursor was that we were using of any kind. And it was the date is, I know, is inflexible. I know well, it was, was 1927. Army signal intelligence. That might have been it. There was well, communication between it was England, Army intelligence England in and the United States. And England is asking the United States in the document. So it's an England document to the US mm -hmm. in the CIA. Do you know anything about the silver disks that are rising in the skies above Piena Monday? And that was what year? 1927. The war way later. Mm. And as I understand it from this man who worked for the CIA, Army cover, extraterrestrials. for reasons that I'm not sure, were literally physically working in Germany underground. And those were extraterrestrial craft. And some deal was supposed to be struck that then we hear about when the Nazis and Hitler pick it up later and there are the Vril mm -hmm. yeah. and the, uh, mm -hmm. the one that's so hard. The Hanabu. The Hanabu. Yeah. Were those made by German humans, 
or were those made by extraterrestrials and passed off to the world as germs? Well, they, were, they, they did uh, have well, mediums that were supposedly in contact with people from Aldebaran or something like the, that. The uh, idea about uh, UFOs not being extraterrestrial and being the result of German technology, Nazi technology, I, I'm with Linda on this. Um, all you really need to do is go back through some of the historical sightings that we have that are very good sightings. And it, there's just no way to explain these as German slash Nazi tech. Is this before uh, the Second World War then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. yes. Absolutely, well before. I mean, uh, if there are discs out of Panamunda in 1927, that's right. not German manufactured, not even <laughs> a chance. German, German <laughs> military was totally demilitarized mm -hmm. in 1927. They were trying ever so hard to sneakily do some uh, training with uh, Russia, Soviet Union actually, and even that was just... That didn't really get going until after Hitler got into power. There, are, I was, um, I did archive uh, work in the Canadian archives uh, a number of years ago, looking at reports that Canadian citizens would send into the RCMP, um, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Right. So back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, if you Canadian citizen had a UFO sighting, you would send it into the police. They would send it off to um, Ottawa where scientists in white coats with bald heads would promptly run away from them and just file them and never look at them again. But the reports are there. You can read them. So I encountered one report from uh, an elderly man writing in 1981 about when he was 25 years old in 1936. So this is a time when the Nazis were in power, but hear this. He was employed as a young man doing aerial mapping operations for the Canadian government in the way, way, way north. Because now there's aircraft and the government wanted accurate topography, geography, maps of that distant region, which they could now do mm -hmm. with aerial photography. So he was at, uh, in the Northwest Territories, way up in uh, what's called the Barren Lands. There's no trees that grow up there. There's nothing there, even to this day, at a place called Islemer Lake. I had to look this up on Google Maps. It's, there's middle of nowhere. And he writes, this is a meticulous man. He was doing a before flight check on his craft, one of those cool aircraft that can land on the water. And he said, and I happened for whatever reason to glance skyward. Now this is a, uh, either spring or summer 1936. And there was the vehicle in question, he said, completely stationary. How long it had been there, for whatever reason, he did not know. It was, uh, he didn't know how large it was because there was no clouds whatsoever, but it was, ex it was right there and he thought it was large. Mm -hmm. Slightly oblong in shape, no markings on it whatsoever no sound, in an instant it turned from a north-south configuration to east-west, and then he said it accelerated instantly, instant acceleration. He said from the moment of takeoff until it was at the horizon was a matter of moments. And uh, he attached his military service record uh, to prove his identity, his veracity. That was not available to me. It was not in the archives. But very, very interesting, compelling story. If and that's not good enough, And there's just one yeah, really yeah. important point. We humans, biologically and technologically, we cannot go from static inertia to the horizon. Well, unless you have a completely Did radical system of propulsion, and good seat belts. Good seat belts. Good seat but, belts. but we're in 1936. <laughs> Not I, th a I think sometimes people right. lose the concept yes, that yes, something good that point. goes that is not. No, it's Anything but any physical, any right. physical exactly, yeah. creature made out of atoms would have the same issue, right? Well, okay. Unless now. you have an artificial gravitational yes. field that you've constructed around mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. and then it's not an issue. In terms That's of different. what we're learning today is that the ET technology is literally interacting with the fundamental laws of vacuum and physics, and they're, it's a complicated concept. But if you can change just one or two pieces of formula, you can match every single thing that is reported about UFOs, including them being larger on the inside than they look on the outside, mm -hmm. being able to go from a to yeah. infinity. Mm -hmm. And it all turns on a tiny change, the tiniest change in a physical reality that is our physics, and we can't do this. We cannot do this tampering. But if we could, everything that we see falls out of this. And 
the craft on the inside is like a completely different dimension than the earth dimension that it's in. It's very complex physics, but we're talking about physics that's becoming understandable. Okay, so yeah. the, a the aliens, whoever they are, there's different, people talk about different, you know, there's good, good aliens, bad aliens, greys, whatever. Some say they're bad, some say they're, uh, they're uh, disarming our, our nuclear missiles. Well, they're interested in our nuclear technology, for sure. I don't think they and want us to have a nuclear war. No, that kills the life they need. Fr from 1945 to the end of the century, there were over 2,000 nuclear explosions on planet Earth, over 2,000. Um, there's a couple of, there's a chilling YouTube video, you can look for this, just uh, has in, in kind of real time, condensed down to 10 minutes, every nuclear explosion on planet Earth with a map of where it took. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, when we talk about the environmental damage that we're dealing with, whether it's uh, climate change or what have you, I don't hear anyone talking about how we blown our stratosphere into smithereens mm -hmm. with over 2,000 nuclear detonations. Um, what we do know, in fact, this is in my yeah. new book, uh, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. I interviewed a um, retired U.S. Navy man who uh, in the early 1960s took place in something called Operation Dominic. So from April to October of 1962, right after the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the U.S. government, in its infinite wisdom, decided it was a good idea to have 36 nuclear explosions in the upper stratosphere off the coast of Hawaii. Great idea. Hmm. So um, huge amount of damage, obviously, yeah. to the environment. Um, I spoke to two gentlemen who were involved in the Navy at that time. Both of them said explicitly, A, there were bogeys every single time Mm. that they looked that, that when there was going to be a detonation. Wow. One of them was explicitly involved in Dominic, and he said this happened all the time, and every time just before detonation took place, the bogeys would disappear. And we knew this always, except on one occasion, actually, when one seemed to come down. And it was a failed uh, retrieval operation in late October 62. It's a fascinating story, and I've written about it. But the point is they're interested in our nuclear technology. They've always been interested in our nukes. You go right back to the beginning, 1940s. All of, of the Freedom of Information Act documents that the U.S. has, which is only the tiniest, the tiniest sliver of the actual reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if you have like this, this uh, white wall and you throw black paint over it and there's a couple of little white spots and that's what we have to look right, at. Right. So those are our documents. Mm -hmm. In those documents, it's evident that our America's nuclear installations from the 40s onward, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Hanford in the state of Washington and others, and then the missile sites, all of them were visited continuously by objects that didn't look normal, that is disc shape or round, didn't act normal, like they could loiter indefinitely and then just hover uh, and then take off, um, shoot straight up, and that, <laughs> you know, this got very, serious attention, obviously, from the um, American and authorities. And the head of White Sands Missile Range at the time of Project Paperclip referred to all those disks that were showing up when they would try their rocket tests as, yeah. this is a quote, peculiar phenomenon, and yeah, it made exactly. local newspapers. This is the head of White Sands operation that is taking German missiles and they're having all of these white disks, and that's what he called them, peculiar. So your, your question, though, was are they good, are they bad, are they indifferent? They're interested in our nukes. They're, I'm sure they must be concerned about the fact that human beings have control over these nukes because this is very dangerous, this, and it's probably not good for them. Is, mm -hmm. is there any? Probably. There's got to be some level of government working with some of these these extraterrestrials do you guys i'm sure in some of your research you must know not just about the craft and the mutilation but how about the individuals conducting these experiments and running these craft and uh, there must be some sort of communication with them when we're learning this back engineering and my workshop yeah. tomorrow at the modern uh, knowledge tour that's exactly what i'm going to be dealing about for two hours so actually talking about the actual types of extraterrestrial and gov government relationship i think there definitely was an agreement i think the united states in or close to the end of world war ii made an agreement is it fair to say guys is it fair to say and either one asked the question are there extraterrestrials walking amongst us? If we walk down the street, is it that a far-fetched thing? I think we would both say yes. Yes, and I would uh, say hybrids. Yes. Yeah. The hybrid so is probably 
the most under discussed subject and probably the most important to every decision the United States has been making since World War II. And so they look human. When you say hybrid, that we would not know I could go to a store to 7-Eleven, buy something, and the cashier could be one. Depends on which genetic generation. Some of them, yes, though, you would not, I don't think you'd be able to tell. Do some, do they even know they're hybrids? That's yes. Okay. So I, yeah. yes. What are they, they really doing working at 7-Eleven? But we really do agree. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> that's funny. We need. That's funny. It's We've collected our own, done our own research, and uh, so, yeah. It is really, really a fundamental issue, and you can step back from this and say, okay, if, if there are extraterrestrial biological entities, and they have, as the, some people have told me, one man who re, w had retired from the Defense Intelligence Agency told me that they knew in his division that three competing geopolitical territorial conflicts among extraterrestrials had been affecting this planet for at least 270 million years, then we, according to a lot of documents, we were made by one or more. That means that technically Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien, and however far back you want to go, we are somebody's genetic construct. Why would anything from outer space be doing this? And this gets into an extremely complicated area that I think Corso was trying to address in that NBC studio. Well, that isn't we it are that where the battle, where the battlefield, we're a prize. Well, but we're where, prize. I, I'm, where I'm headed, and you can pick it up, is that everything interacting with this planet may not be strictly extraterrestrial from the solar system next door. That a lot of the phenomena may truly be from a far distant future. And the whole, this is the hardest part of all of this phenomena to grasp. Past, present, and future are simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And that us, 50,000 years in the future could be at extinction. So we're doing this to ourselves, Linda? Is that what you're kind this of sort of? This is what RAF Bentwaters is all about. But, but hang in here for just okay. one more idea, and I'll throw it to Rich. If we at this table, knowing our current human form, right here as mm -hmm. we're talking to each other, who, no matter who made us. And we could see through a time dilation machine that all of the seven billion and whatever happens next, that there is a bloodline, there is an arc, and that it can go for 50,000 years and in the process the technology becomes so advanced it can bend space-time. As soon as, in quantum physics, it's Einstein, when you bend space and you put a point of, of space together with another point, which then now you're affecting gravity, always time is also manipulated. And that what has been emerging out of cases like R.E.F. Bentwaters and others, is that what gets to the skies and to the surface of Earth may actually be time travelers who would be like doctors, mm -hmm. would be like paramedics. They have a serious problem where physics is advanced, but the bodies have deteriorated to such a point because why? Because they cloned. They cloned and used hybrids and sex seized. And it's the same problem that we are looking at now in the issue of biodiversity on the earth and genetically modified crops. I was going to say, it sounds like human Monsanto. Every scientist will it tell you. It would take you, a lot less than 50,000 years, <laughs> well, though, Linda, for but, that whole mess to but, happen. But it's, we are taking all of our biodiversity down to a few strains. Mm. If you do that same thing over 50,000 years in humanoid containers, and you leave sexual genes to cloning and to hybridization, mm -hmm. the 
the story so far is that they are dying. They've reached extinction. DNA will no longer replicate. So what do they do? They're advanced enough to come back in time because they can fold space. And you come back to the last century where genetic material on Earth was healthy enough to harvest. And it's Penniston and Bentwaters who used the word that came into his mind, allegedly from a download from this craft in the forest. They are using us as Band-Aids, meaning genetically they are harvesting, relating to something 50,000 years in the future to survive. And that's why when you ask that question, is it good or bad, I wrestle with this all the time. But in my first book, An Alien Harvest, it came out in 1989, I remember feeling that even though I was in the repulsive subject of animal mutilations, that there was something that I intuitively felt that it was a survival issue. And the survival can be a two-way or three-way street. And so where we sit today in 2014, where humans are about, it feels like every day, getting closer and closer mm -hmm. to war of mm -hmm. humans, mm -hmm. that something related to us, something intimately related to the evolution of this planet, is involved with trying to survive, and the irony in all of this is, it may be it's our survival as well, that they're braided. That's what is repeated over and over and over again in the human abduction syndrome, that whatever is happening, no matter who made us, we are intimately involved in a timeline with something coming from the future that needs genetic material from this planet for it to survive, and if it survives, we survive. That's how complex all of this is. Well, speaking of timelines, it looks like we're just about out of time here. Um, so if people want to... Um, Let's jump on another timeline and well, extend it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're just going to wrap it up here uh, be, uh, so we can get on with uh, Michael Tellinger. But uh, Linda, that's a great, that's a, really something to think about. If And people can come and see your, uh, you're doing a presentation tomorrow. Lecture, right? we're, I think each one of us lecture. And we're yeah. going to, we're going to, we're going to, yeah, of course. I mean, but we, we are, well. lecture and workshop. Is this together? You guys are doing it? Uh, no, we're doing each doing our own. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, you've got books and you've got a website, Linda? Yes. <laughs> My books are too big to lug around and ship around. And I made them big so that the documents and the photographs could be really, really clear. But don't be overwhelmed by that. No. Th <laughs> I think y you would find them very valuable. But, so I only have one place okay. and the prices never change. It isn't like eBay or s others. Um, and it's earthfiles.com. My news website, earthfiles.com, uh, has been there since 1999 and evolving and huge now. And so there is a uh, shop there where all my work always is. Mm -hmm. And uh, earthfiles at earthfiles.com is my email. Okay. And I'd look forward to hearing from anybody about anything. Okay, that's awesome. And Richard, you're, what's, you want to just tell us briefly about your, uh, your subject matter tomorrow? I'd be happy to, yes. Um, I've been honing and working this uh, lecture since I've been on this tour. It's a 90-minute uh, extravaganza into a rethinking of the entire UFO subject, which is really the, the theme of my latest book, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. That is dealing with the UFO phenomenon in terms of its its intrinsic mystery, why it, I believe it stands really at the very edge of our, our, our un ability to understand our, our worldview as it is, and then beyond that. Uh, the politics, the deep politics, not the uh, grade school level version of politics that we get in our media, but what's actually going on in terms of uh, the concealment of information, why that is so, why the science of um, that in, in affects the UFO phenomenon is so very important. I've got a lot to say on that and then looking into the future as to how I, I really think all of this is going to come to an end in another decade or so. When you say <laughs> it's going to come to an end, what does this, that mean? This, <laughs> this, this is, we're, in a, we're not in a holding pattern. So we're in a situation where our, our, our society is 
is almost leapfrogging over itself and reinventing itself every decade. And I believe something's going to transform this situation so that something will come out. I, I, I don't Positive know. Positive or? What will that no, do for it, real estate values? A, it'll be a big, listen, we're, w this, this whole, everything that we have here is, uh, is ephemeral. And uh, something major is going to change it. So it and sounds to me that like we're, we're speaking of like a shift in consciousness. Are we talking we're something like that? We're going to have like a shift that? in infrastructure. We're going to have a lot of crazy people pulling their hair out of their heads, running around in circles. Mm -hmm. Shift in consciousness. People have been talking about that was supposed to happen in December 21, 2012, if you recall. <laughs> Uh, not saying that was it another won't timeline, happen. Richard. Sorry. Ah, yes, there we go. <laughs> no, I don't. I think um, what we're going to have to do is is called growing up. So we're going to wow. have to deal with a new situation, and um, it's like all aspects of growing up. It will be painful, but it will be necessary, and I think we'll come out of it better than before. My workshop, uh, I've done the last the last few of these. It's worked out very well. I actually sit down and have discussion with people, and we tend to share experiences and try to figure out what is going on. A number of people have been experiencers who've talked mm -hmm. about um, their, um, their situation and um, I basically leading an intimate discussion among people who are interested in us. Okay, great. And what's your website for people Richard, who want to follow up? Uh, RichardDolanPress.com. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for all the work you do, for being uh, pioneers in what you do and for moving us forward because I think your work is so important in just uh, – and you add so much credibility so that when I go home and I talk about UFOs and ETs, my family doesn't look at me and say, okay, you know what, here we go again. Thank you. I feel, I feel like the luckiest person I know. I get to research something that I'm truly obsessively fascinated by, and I get to do it uh, all the time. It can be maddening. I'm sure you agree, Linda. But it's also incredibly rewarding because yeah. uh, we are, we're both explorers. We're both uh, doing what we can do to, to figure out, I think, what is one of the, a series of the greatest mysteries that we can be encountering. And it's in mm -hmm. the process of going through this, by the way, in which you reinvent your world view countless times, because that's what happens, that um, that's, that's true growth right there. Absolutely, and whether yeah. we'll get to the, the goal line and figure it all out, I don't know, but it's the journey that matters. And it feels like it is trying to find out what we really are. Yes. All right. Yeah. So, exactly. Hugh, from now on, when I say, what planet are you from? I can actually mean that. <laughs> and and my answer will remain the same. <laughs> Which, I don't even know Which one? <laughs> Arcturus. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. The so red, blue, and white one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, the for coming one. on the show. To, and for people watching tonight, of course, show up at the Science Center tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. And you can uh, meet these guys and participate. And uh, we're going to take a little for break a right now. very normal discussion. Exactly. And we're going to come back in a couple of minutes with Michael Tellinger. And we're looking forward to that. We'll be right back. Thank you, guys.
back here on the show and it's me Hugh Riley and Sandra Kirzakos is here and now we uh, have the great pleasure of having as a hybrid well I just found out you're a hybrid That's from I don't know the I planet just found yet. that out too I just don't know the color of the sky on your planet <laughs> but I hear you even have green grass on your planet and it's it's all natural okay no pesticides Good. Uh, but we have the great pleasure of having uh, Michael Tellinger joining us here and uh, Louise, uh, his uh, life partner. We and, won't say uh, better half, equal half. <laughs> and Michael is the founder and the leader of the Ubuntu party. In Whoa, well done. Yay, Yay. Very well done. That's yeah. the best pronunciation I've heard in Canada yet. Well, you Whoa. just taught me before we came on, so <laughs> thank you for doing that because we've been you know, using that word for a few years now uh, with the operating system, the Linux operating system. Yeah. And uh, but uh, you've got a political party in South Africa that you've started, and and now you're touring across Canada, and you were just telling us uh, that the movement is growing, and now it's now it's in Canada. Can you just give us a, an introduction to what Ubuntu is really all about, and and what it means uh, for everybody in South Africa, and now for people in Canada? Well, the word Ubuntu is would be familiar to anyone in Africa. Pretty much most people in Africa will understand the meaning of Ubuntu. Uh, and it's an ancient uh, African tradition. It's, it's, it's in the blood of the people of Africa. Uh, and it really talks about community and, and how community can operate as, as one conscious organism for the benefit of everyone while allowing diversity within, within the community. Uh, and the the one definition that is often used to describe the word Ubuntu is I am who I am because of who we all are. And um, <clears throat> this is really why um, what I started calling contributionism in 2005, uh, realizing several years later that it actually is a complete mirror of uh, the ancient philosophy of Ubuntu, and therefore it became Ubuntu as the ancient philosophy mm -hmm. and contributionism as a a 21st century ideology of a philosophy of people moving away from a money-driven society still trapped within the uh, the, the social socio-economic structure that we find ourselves in we can't extricate ourselves from it so Ubuntu contributionism the ancient and the current combining to take us into the future uh, of, of a way ahead for humanity so. so Michael can you make that real for us what does that look like trying to because you're talking about bringing this beautiful philosophy in 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 a world that is so anti or seemingly the opposite well and let's get into what that means in more detail contributionism yeah what does it mean in terms of policy direction and that sort of thing um, the reason the answer to that is it's not a one sentence answer or a discussion we can have in half an hour but it well, is this two. is why yeah okay let's give it 30 <laughs> seconds then <laughs> so, the, it, i mean it, the the information is encoded in the word contribute contributionism mm -hmm. where people contribute their god-given um, talents and acquired skills for the greater benefit of everyone in the community it's about cooperation as opposed to competition it's about constructive cooperation rather than destructive competition okay. it's about um, moving away from a money-driven society to communities driven by people and their passions for life. It's about everything, removing ourselves from all the negative and dark aspects of, of humanity that we've been dumped into and, and led into ignorantly, like ignorant little children dragged into this situation that we're in right now, realizing, oh my goodness, this is, this is not a good place to be, mm -hmm. but how do we get out of it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the I believe, and, and Louise and everyone that's finding this philosophy, this is the bright light at the end of a dark and gloomy tunnel and it is not a train coming towards us. It is the exit of the dark and gloomy tunnel into the universal light. Okay. Now when you say some of the things like you just said, your description of contributionism, I, it kind of reminds me of like Karl Marx, you know, from each according to their abilities <coughs> to each according to their needs. Mm -hmm. And that didn't really work out that well. Well, of um, course it didn't work out. All these great philosophies always get hijacked by the bankers. 
and every great country that in, that in, in instituted a people's bank, and I believe Canada was one such country. The moment a people's bank is instituted, so that it removes the people from that slavery of the from the banking families, thousands of years, um, the the might and the the political influence of the banking elite is so powerful that they always infiltrate the political arena and reverse that situation. So, so, so basically, you're saying it's not really it's not the idea that was flawed; it was the people. Yeah, Running, Look, I, who took charge well, of the idea? I must tell you that I don't know much about Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about communism. I don't know much about any of those things. And the reason I'm telling you this is when I started writing the philosophy of contributionism in 2005, I made a very specific point not to read anything that's mm -hmm. come before. I didn't want to taint any uh, or give myself any um, sort of. Uh, whatever, misguided information or try and latch onto something that's come before, try and mm -hmm. fix things. So I try to keep myself as pure as possible and come up with, with answers and solutions that came absolutely from the heart. Looking at the current problem, how do I feel about the world? How do I feel about the misery and strife of the people around me uh, in my community, the, the greater country and the world? And what solutions can I come up with? And that's what it came, that's what it became. And, so where did you find that? Where did you find that? Um, I have no You're, idea, okay. uh, and that's why I believe that th this is these things are truly led by divine intervention. That we choose our paths and we choose our lives, and somehow I have, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to find the path and and the groove that I that I was or I chose for myself, and I recognized it, or it found me, one whichever way it worked, and had the courage to step in too, because I, that I, so. I mean that can't. You know, you can't say that enough. It takes a lot of courage to do that and to do what you're doing and, and creating a whole movement, you know, with yeah. this. But and to, to Hugh's point, um, when we move forward, what does, what does it look like? How can we move forward into the contributionism and Ubuntu? How can we... Yeah. Uh, look, I, I do talk about it in my presentations, but I, I do outline it in great detail in my book. This is why I had to write a book about it, because it's something that you have to take people mm -hmm. on a step-by-step -step incremental uh, breakdown of the poisoned minds that we have, of the preconceived ideas, of the programming, the brainwashing, the indoctrination, the, the, the regimented way we think about what we believe to be human nature, which is completely the opposite of what human nature is, and, and all these things that have completely uh, uh, indoctrin uh, well, actually, the, the money-driven poison that has infiltrated every crack and crevice of our humanness and our beingness and of our lives and our planet. Um, so moving from where we are today does not necessarily mean it's going to take a long time. It means we have to start walking the path, walking the journey, and we've started that already. Louise is running the Ubuntu Village, which is really the head office of the Ubuntu movement in South Africa where she's bringing in volunteers from all over the world. Mm -hmm. She can talk more about that. Yeah. That are coming to share their experiences with us and and uh, add value to what we're doing while we're taking the whole town, a whole little town of about 4,000 people, and turning that into what we hope to b become the first Ubuntu contributionism community. Now, this is not an easy task. No kidding. But. It, there are some very basic steps that you can take to start that process. And I think that applies to every town, every village, in every country. It's a lot easier to do it in small towns and small villages than it is, is to do it in the city. But once you've implemented this, and I'm going to be talking about this in my mm -hmm. workshop tomorrow for two hours in great detail, the step-by-step -step increments, how do we go from zero to hero? And once that story unfolds, you realize that it's really very simple. It's a simple, logical, step-by-step, -step, moving into our own power, taking back what's been, what we believe has been taken away from us, and sharing that knowledge and the power with the rest of the community. And very quickly, we can move from one step to the other. Um, and it, it's going to require many steps to get mm -hmm. us from here to there, but it doesn't mean it's going to take a long time. It can happen very quickly. A revolution of consciousness, mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. most revolutions mm -hmm. in human history, they happen very quickly. Just in a blink of an eye, there's a bloody revolution, and this hopefully is not going to be a bloody revolution. It's going to be a very... Uh, it's metaphorical. Beautiful, yes. <laughs> beautiful revolution 
of high consciousness and just shifting the energy, saying, thank you for teaching us what we should not be doing. Mm -hmm. The last 6,000 years mm -hmm. have been a painful mm -hmm. journey of mm -hmm. rediscovering who we are as human beings. And we're now going to take the route that we should be taking. Does that mean that part of what you're doing in the Ubuntu village involves either an alternative currency or some sort of monetary reform? Um, I know that Louise has a big problem with this, but uh, as part of, because ultimately we, sh we should go from zero to hero. We don't need money. This is the ultimate final destination. Mm -hmm. Money is a complete and utter tool of enslavement. But how do we rid ourselves from the money? It's like a drug. It is the ultimate drug of our species, beyond religion, beyond anything else. It is the yeah. untouchable, the undebatable, the unchallengeable drug. You can attack Catholicism, you can attack Jews and Muslims and anyone, but you can't attack the money. You can't go there. Most people still do not allow themselves to go there. Well, and people don't even think about it. Of course right? not. They just accept money and the monetary system yes. as a given. Yes. Right, but it's a human construct. But even yeah. yes. e even behind that, though, even behind the whole money is the, the be all end all. Isn't it really the real currency is is food? Because if you if it's because the money is controlling the food supply. If the yeah. money we did not control the food supply, we could say see you later to the money. Yeah. Well, you see now you put, you 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 you're throwing out stuff that ultimately at high conscious beings we won't need to eat. Because ultimately, we can feed off the energy of... Okay, of my sister is in the audience <laughs> right now. I want you to hear that. Can you, can we, oh, we yeah. could just play she that back? She told me that Sanders a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, so. because we are, we can, absolutely. It's, it's all about whether or not we're willing to go there and the consciousness. I mean, there are breath, what we call breatharians, people yeah. who don't eat. They're already on the planet. Even so though they sneak Big Macs in. Yeah. Late at night. <laughs> Look, the only food That's the I, I believe the old that the universal contract that was made with the with the prana consuming breatharians of higher consciousness is that they've signed contracts that they will eat Big Macs, nothing else. I heard that. <laughs> yeah. And and but anyway, the, but just to come back to uh, the the monetary system. Yeah. Uh, this is why when you look at what we did with the Ubuntu party, now again, some people say, "Why did you go into politics? You're going into you know you follow you just." It, we have to inject the virus into the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and if we didn't participate in the South African elections, nobody would have heard about yeah. us. The countries around the world would not have paid attention to yeah. us. Yeah. It is, it, it's not whether we got in or no. we didn't yeah. get in, it's our presence, the fact that we are present there. And if you ask Louise, during the four days or five days that we spent at the IEC conference, that huge warehouse with the big screens as the results start coming mm -hmm. back in, we had a pile of my books on the table and, and it was just lying there. And one by one, all these other political parties would come sort of, they come hover around our table and they'd be looking at the book and eventually they'd be, build up enough courage to say, um, are you selling those? You know? And the answer was no, they, they just take one. And, uh, and they go, really? Can wow. I take one? Yeah. Are you wow. the author? Will you sign it for me? <laughs> it was like, and wow. including the ANC including the ruling political party. And wow. at one stage, I think it was Sid or one of the other people went around, I don't know if it was you, baby, that, and said that they saw the Ubuntu contributions and book lying on every table of each political party in the elections. Now, that's, if that's not planting a seed of consciousness... I, I was, there's your job exactly. done, right? That's, so, Louise, look, let's, let's talk to Louise a little yeah. bit and just talk, talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the village because this is what's making it real for us so we can get a feel. Maybe we can just, you know, through the workshop, get templates and kind of plant little Ubuntu villages here. So what does that look like? And, and well, I'm not sure if we could create a template because each environment's unique, you know. But what we're really trying to do is to get a place where we can start implementing the philosophy of Ubuntu and getting people familiar with, with what we are and, and what we're doing and, and get them keen to start taking that step towards contributing, towards the community as a whole, so that we can start moving away from the currency. You know. And there is there's nothing like everybody can do something, right? Everybody, everybody can, can do it doesn't something. even Absolutely. if you don't have the degree, even if you don't, you know, have are not yes. the talented <laughs> artists, everybody can do something. And we can all learn from one another and I'm seeing that so much now. We've got volunteers from everywhere. We've actually got a Canadian in our village now, Tammy. And we're all learning mm. so much from each other and it we just came together as 
people of like mind and the willingness to, to come together and say, hey, we love this philosophy. We know that it's the future for, for who we are and what we want to do. And we, we've come together. And it's just right at the beginning. We're still implementing the community projects. We're just about to start doing that uh, large-scale food production and fish farming. We're busy renovating the community hall. And people in the community and our international volunteers are coming together and working together, and it's beautiful. You know, that's really what Ubuntu is. Now, are some of these people, like the girl that's from Canada, are some of these going to take them home? Like, are they planning to come back and maybe take absolutely. some of those ideas and bring them here? Is that, yes, uh, absolutely. and that's really planting the seed worldwide yes. too, right? So I'm the, what I'd like to add to that is, is uh, that, because um, I think it was one of the first questions you asked is, you know, how's Ubuntu growing and so forth, is that w we now have members in more than 200 countries around the world. Now, that was completely unimaginable, wow. even a year ago. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we were just a bunch of, you know, people that started this thing, yeah. and Louise started the Facebook page, and we started getting people subscribing on our website, and now more than 200 countries. In fact, Sid Orgain, that joined us just before the elections, because, you know, I knew Sid as a, as a being of higher consciousness, and he's like a... a, 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 a a re research monster yeah. he's mm. just incredible mm. he joined us and now he's the driving force at home um, uniting people in other countries and setting up I think he's working in about 125 countries that are starting the Ubuntu party right now it's a global united political front which is completely unique it's never been done before so are there I mean are there as a political party are there specific you know is there a specific platform or for example, if, if the Ubuntu party were to get elected tomorrow in South Africa, what would change? A what, lot, would a lot will work? change. And, and that's really the platform that is now being given to all the other countries that want to start the Ubuntu party, like in Canada here. Um, we, we're growing as a family in Canada beyond our wildest imagination. I mean, we're leaving behind a wake of consciousness that it's grown. We don't even know what we've done. We just know we've done something. We can feel it. And we, we've picked mm -hmm. up incredible people of consciousness like Eliza Knockwood that joined mm -hmm, us mm -hmm. because we just completely connected with her and resonate with her. And she's a warrior for human rights and high consciousness beyond belief. We're going to meet more Native Canadians as we travel. And so by the time we finished in Vancouver, there's going to be a highway of consciousness from one coast to the other. So when the guys that are really Dave and, and Chris that are responsible for the, for the tour... Uh, when they, I believe, uh, as they suggested, start and register the Ubuntu party in Canada and all the other people that have already put their hand up that they want to participate, that family is going to be several hundred people, not just a few dozen like we had in South Africa, not even a few dozen, a f a f less than a dozen. Yeah. In Canada, it's going to go from less than a dozen people that, that it was in South Africa. It was probably more like three or four people. In Canada, it's going to go to several hundred people. That is serious exponential growth. The same is happening in Germany and Austria and in Australia, um, in the USA and so forth. So I believe that in the next five years, as these Ubuntu parties are, are established uh, across many countries, in the next five years, we will see Ubuntu party participating as a political platform of consciousness in all these countries, creating, as Louis said, the first time transnational, transborder, universal party or a global party of higher consciousness that comes from the same philosophy of unity consciousness. And it cannot be distorted. It's totally pure in its construct, in its, in its inception, in its in, uh, seedling origin. I think this, it's so fascinating that this is being birthed in Africa, South Africa, because it really is the cradle of civilization. And even from an energetic and a consciousness perspective, if anybody has studied consciousness or knows anything um, about that from an energetic perspective, Africa is really the cradle. It's where everything started. And it seems to be the f on the forefront of every, it seems to be the leader of where humanity goes. Mm -hmm. And when you speak about um, it may have started with three people or four people in, in Africa, and, but it's like 30, you know, it's like, you know, hundreds of people here. I really believe it's because the strength of the energy, it's like a vortex. And the strength of the energy there where, you know, you have three plus four does not equal a seven, it equals 34. Yeah. And so it has this, it's this exponential. Exactly. Consciousness doesn't know linear 
energy it's it's just it's gonna just blow up yeah. and i think that's maybe what you're you're experiencing yeah. that feels like what that's where that's going i do need to correct something though it didn't start with three people the the political movement started with three people people in africa have been practicing ubuntu for thousands of years okay so i need to okay. respectfully ask for forgiveness for saying that being so so blatantly arrogant in that statement but what i mean by is putting it down on paper bringing it into the political arena in which we can use this ancient philosophy to inject as i said inject mm. the seed of consciousness into the beast okay so, so if we're going to if we're going to include all the people then we have to include all the animals in africa because the elephants play a big role I, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know about that. You know, I think we need to separate animals from humans. I think, you know, there are too many bloody elephants. In I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, boy, because we would have a whole discussion <laughs> on that. That's, I can tell you that, boy. <laughs> the bloody elephants, the they're just tonight. destroying everything, Break, breaking down the fences. You know, you put up fences for them and they break them down. What's wrong with these elephants? That's because they know? want to be around the people. That's why. <laughs> it's all about yeah. unity. Where is that unity, Michael? Yeah. Um, but no, and those lions, you know, they... they <laughs> no, but truly, I, I mean, really, it's it really is about the culture there. It's about it's about the way of life there. You know that I think is to totally true to who we are, as opposed to who we're not. What you were saying off the top, and I think that's for whatever reason um, that thread is very strong there. It seems to have gotten diluted. Well, it's strong because we're still connected to the earth. You know, all these cultures around the 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 world that are still living close to the earth that mm. are still living outside that aren't totally westernized uh, still have that connection and that's vital you know <laughs> just on that point so because we do see that, that there is a, a a struggle between indigenous culture and uh, and w if you want to call it western culture or whatever culture that's moved around the globe and seemingly has squashed the ind indigenous cultures mm. wherever it has the indigenous cultures tend to live with the earth and, and towards the yes. earth and I'm just very I'm happily happily yeah but I wonder what the connection is because Michael you mentioned that the the banking interests the bankers always come in and destroy everything and is there a yeah. connection between that ancient banking interest or maybe mm -hmm. 6,000 year old or whatever banking interest and this tendency of conquering cultures to to try to e eradicate uh, you know indigenous culture of course there is, and I think Linda mm. spoke about it earlier in your interview. There's this mm. strange otherworldly obsession to try and control this planet for some reason that we don't understand. We're trying to figure it out mm. for ourselves, and, and this is where our humanness can't deal with it because humanity in nature is a, is we, we beautiful, beautiful creatures. Mm -hmm. We're divine creatures. And, and we don't understand in our deeper essence brutality and conflict. It's not part of human nature. It was, it's been imposed on us over a very long period of time that we have now absorbed and this is how we started behaving. Uh, that's not what humanity and humans are all about. Uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we are directly connected to source. It's encoded in our DNA and this is most likely I uh, say this most likely why there's so much interest in our body and our physical and why these ETs keep coming taking samples of us and you know and, and abducting people and because of what is in our DNA our connectedness to the true divine source of all things and all the knowledge that goes along with that but that takes us away from how we're going to conquer the world with Ubuntu <laughs> well okay so <laughs> And how are you going to counter? Because you mentioned yeah. that these banking interests, they come in That's and they it. ruin everything. And uh, I think you've experienced uh, some oh, pushback yeah. from that mm, area. Yeah. You know, and how do we overcome that? Well, we don't need to overcome it. We need to, we need to just side, sidestep it. You know, you know when you and and I think that David Whitehead will teach you in in martial arts. You know, if you if you resist the force, mm -hmm. you're going to struggle. If mm -hmm. you si sidestep the force and just let it go past you, uh, you'll find ways of of overcoming the opposition and the resistance. But and see, that takes a, a certain. I mean, because you talk a lot about consciousness, yeah. and I think that's the saving grace here. I think that's what allows you to sidestep, as you're saying, as you speak about, because I think really from what it sounds like what you're speaking the big big thing here that probably is why marxism may not have worked is that the consciousness is at a level where they can now yeah. understand this from a different perspective and then approach it differently
played. Is that is that uh, absolutely the it it is yeah. Yeah. We don't really even need to sidestep it. We we need to direct our energy towards something that we want to create rather than focus on what we what we're trying to find. Yes, that makes a lot we of sense. We need to create something new and beautiful that's real for everybody. If somebody, um, I'm not sure who it was that said it. When you fight, you become the fight. Yeah. So you kind of you take on an energy you of just, the fight. You just increase its power if you're fighting it. So and if the rules are made for them, you're going to lose anyway, right? Because yeah. it's within the system. Exactly. And they are the ones that created the rules and the laws. And if you go f go in there, I oh know, I speak from experience. You go into the courts. Anyway, Canada, the, mm -hmm. the, the old uh, commonwealth countries, right? Uh, you go in there, you, you fight the same draconian legal system was created to sub to uphold the the corporate structure and the legal structure it's, it's all about corporate laws and upholding the laws the the rights of corporations not upholding the rights of human beings and this is why there's such a huge global emphasis on bringing back uh, common law courts and so forth but that's not going to work either if you try and in insert common law courts into the current legal system because it's just not going to work you, that, that needs to operate outside of the current system completely separate as a new uh, entity that we're creating for humanity um, and just to come back to a very long delayed answer to the question about the monetary system uh, is that what, to wean ourselves off the money, we need to use the money to free ourselves from the money system. It's as crazy as it may sound. Unfortunately, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go from zero to hero. Can't mm -hmm. say tomorrow we're going to not use money. Mm -hmm. That's just going <laughs> to cause mm -hmm. more chaos than we could have imagined. So, by in our South African um, political manifesto, we are very harping on the fact that we're going to close the Reserve Bank. And I know for people that haven't seen our TV commercials from our <laughs> from our. Uh, South African elections, and I trust those will be used around the world as the Ubuntu party starts to get set up. We said very clearly in our political manifesto, we're going to close down the Reserve Bank because it's a private corporation uh, run from Switzerland, uh, and we're going to replace it with a people's bank that issues money for the people, by the people, tax-free and interest-free, which will guarantee 100% employment. Yeah, I can hear people applauding. So that is the first step to making people realize the, the, the global banking and financial fraud that has been imposed on humanity, mm -hmm. that realization itself is a huge liberation of the way we think and how we see ourselves moving forward, how we see the role of money you being used as a tool to help humanity rather than to enslave mm -hmm. and, and subdue humanity, which is what it's become. Mm -hmm. Enslave humanity. We move the private bankers, make it available for everyone and every community for whatever it is they need to do to uplift their communities, what people start to realize very quickly with this people's bank scenario is that money is always available for everything we need. And we're just getting more and more abundance on every level in a free energy area, in alternative uh, farming, in, in uh, alternative building, in, in alternative communication, everything and anything that your mind can imagine. Suddenly this money is always available for everything and sooner or later somebody is going to say, well, why, why do we need to go to the bank to get the money? Why don't we just build the bridge? Mm -hmm. Why do we get get the money to build the bridge? Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, and this is where the contributionist models like we are building, instituting those kind of philosophies, the community projects into which people contribute a few hours a week, three hours a week, that create so much abundance in a tiny community that that abundance can be exported to many other communities. Mm -hmm. So it's a multiple effect. Once that is seen, that money is going to disappear so quickly. And once it starts that channel, no amount of persuasion by any kind of banking institution is going to make people go back to the money system. It's just not possible. And this is why it is the true infective seed of consciousness that will break down the capitalistic system. Once it happens, it's not possible for capitalism to survive and exist or the use of money to survive and exist in any way or form with an Ubuntu contributionist community or any way close to its proximity. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. We're just thinking about that for a minute, Michael. Yeah. Well, you know what? No, I thought you had a question because you tapped me on the leg and every time well, he, he wants me to shut yeah, up, yeah. he usually taps me underneath Tap. and nobody can see it. Yes. But now they know. <laughs>
Has he been tapping so, you? So, so, so has, he been ta- has, has he been tapping you? So yes, he's been tapping up, me. I don't have a question. Lu- okay. Louise is bursting at the seam. She wants to. She wants to download a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. No, Louise, really? I, I, go, go. Do you have something? Download. Do you, <laughs> no, because okay. So, but what what I did want to ask you is okay. I mean, that sounds amazing, and it sounds like there's a, a, a structured plan in place, which is great because a lot of people talked about you know the Occupy movement, and it was amazing. Mm-hmm. But now. Now what? There's this gap. Yeah, exactly. So, and it seems like now we're we're moving forward. We've created that space for for something new to come. I wish you yeah. could see the emails that I was sending to the Occupy movement while it was going on. I was sending email after email to whoever I could try and find, saying, no "Guys, here's the plan of action. You're right there. Now tell them what you're going to do when you stop the bankers. This is what you must tell them." They weren't ready for it. That's just two years ago. Right. But you know what? Maybe, maybe on a consciousness level, maybe they did create that space, and that's why you're they being did. so they embraced did, now. Exactly. Yes. So, so okay. So, what is there anything that we can do right now for people that are listening? Is there anything that I can do right now to go home? I'm open to this. I would love to see this. I want to move there, mm-hmm. um, into that movement. So, what? How can I? What can I do in my daily life to kind of move towards that shift where I can start bringing that stuff into my life? What can I do as I go home right now? Is there anything? Do you want me to answer that? Do you want to answer that? Go. Well, f- first of all, um, tell everybody about Ubuntu and contributions. Okay. That's f- obviously the first thing to do. And because you don't know enough about it yet, you know, you're excited about it. You know in your heart of hearts it's the way to go. Mm-hmm. Right? Something inside of you is resonating with it. And this is what happens to people. They get onto it. They see. They hear a little bit about it. And it's a home run. It's a home run. Consciousness, it's grand slam, baby, and you go. This is it. This is this is what we need to be doing. But it's like a a, a reborn Christian, right? Yeah. Or a little child that finds something very exciting. You know, this is the thing, but you don't know enough about it, and that's the problem. So this is why I wrote the book. So get a copy of the book, even if it's your book. So not everybody can always afford to buy books and all that. And give them books. Say, read this. It is the quickest and the easiest way to get through the step-by-step breaking down, introduction of the the storyline of the origins of money, the control, and then the solution. So it presents both. So you've, you, you inform yourself, so you've got the background of the arguments mm-hmm. of the conspiracy theorists, naysayers, and so forth. You've got the background and the information of why the world is so screwed up and who's in control and then immediately flows into the solutions, which are the obvious outflow of where the problem started. And it's all about the money. So once we know that the money is the root of the control thousands of years ago, we get to a point we say, okay, got to get rid of the money. And what happens when you get rid of the money? And therefore the step-by-step. So talk to everybody about Ubuntu contributionism. If you can, give them a book to read. First, read it yourself. because it, it's Make sure you know what you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> it's a lot easier. And, yeah. and I know, I, too, I speak from experience. And Louise and I have actually agreed that before anybody else comes into the Ubuntu village, they've got to read the book. And it's like, because I'll tell you what happens. is People think they know what it, how it works. They, they read one or two articles about it and they think, oh, I know how it works. And they come there with a completely distorted idea. And they start to... No, they, they grasp the greater philosophy, but they, they're not clued up as to how we're going to start implementing yes. it. And so we have to keep <coughs> explaining to them. Whereas if they read the book... That would be done. It's, it's a lot done. easier. So you, you, you talk, you're actually talking about the same things. You're singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah. yeah and, and for people that don't know what the book looks like, thanks. Oh, well, thanks, Chris. There we go. There, there, there we go. Uh, where's the camera? <laughs> uh, right there. Uh, over there, yeah. That's what the book looks over like. Over here, over here. And, oh, phone. there we go. And it's, <laughs> and it's deeply encoded with, with, with esoteric information. So you don't have to read it. You just have to look at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and for, I, for people, for, uh, I've had some people email me and, and put on Facebook, oh, Tellinger is a Illuminati. Look at the Illuminati symbolisms in uh, there. And they'd be right. But <laughs> it is a reverse psychology here. We're sending them a message. We know what you're up to. We know your symbolisms. And we've used it in our own book, encoded with all the symbolisms, but for the right reasons. Right. So this is deeply encoded with the highest level of consciousness and positive energy has been put into this cover so that they know that we know. 
and leave us alone. That's what this message is. Oh, yeah. Okay. And awesome. some more claps. <laughs> now, are you going to have any of these books available tomorrow at the Science Center? Where oh, you're yeah. Be speaking? yeah. Uh, we, we are missing them in the first uh, first part of the trip. And uh, we still owe, I still owe some people in Halifax some books. Uh, so, But they're here now as from Montreal. We've had the books with us. So, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So um, now is there a website that you want to give out where people can find out more about Ubuntu and get their hands on the book, order a copy, that sort of thing? Yeah. UbuntuParty.org.za or as we call it, ubuntuparty.org.za. Z-A. That's what we say too. Hey, Z-A. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So I believe that Canada was originally just called um, C-N-D. C-A-N-A-D-A. Put on bum. Okay, yeah, that's sorry. that's like African humor, right? <laughs> Actually, I think it's Stomp and Tom. Yeah. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Time to send us Africans back home, right? <laughs> So, guys. well, wait a second. I have a okay. question. Uh -huh. So, okay, if somebody wanted to start an Ubuntu party here, it, and would they be an affiliate? How would they hook up? Like, is there a way to? It's not an affiliate. It's just it's just a collaboration. Just, okay. Um, yeah. But I know Sid Orgain is working very uh, strongly on the political front, and I'm working to create a portal, an interactive internet portal, so that we can list and and show all communities that follow the Ubuntu philosophy and connect all people that are interested in the political front so that we have one website for Ubuntu Planet that we call it and everything is there. So, there so they could go there to like, I mean, for somebody who doesn't even know where to start. Yeah, it for would information to connect to, to, to people in various countries. Mm. You know. the, the portal that Louise is talking about is in the making, so it's not up yet. So yeah. in the interim, just go to ubuntuparty.org.za and go in, go up on the right. It says join us. Okay. Click there and fill in the, your details, and it asks you for your country. So put Canada in there so people know that you're from Canada. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, sorry, it's a, it's a joke on the road. You know, I've been calling it Canada because if Australians come from Australia, surely Canadians come from Canada. You know, it's a <laughs> silly kind of African rationale. And what would Americans be called? United States, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, so is your next tour going to be in the U.S. to plant the seeds across the U.S.? Well, you know, we've been doing this for five years now. This is, this oh. is our fifth year in a row. It's USA and Canada. This is our third visit to Canada. So this, is not, this has been a long time coming. So this is your third visit to Canada? Yes. When was the first and two? In 2010 so. was my first visit. No, okay. 2011 was my first visit. No, uh, see, I forget. 11, 12. 2011, 11, 11 and 12, yes. And so, and I, how how different is it now? Now uh, the third time well, around, look uh, at is this. it more condos? L look, at, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at this. Uh, it's, it's more a, unity you consciousness. Said it, one of you said it's an idea whose time has come. So we've done the groundwork, we've planted the seeds, and look how they've grown. Wow, that's okay. All right. Well, really great to have you guys here. And Thanks we're gonna, so much for coming. We're going to have a question and answer period too, right? Oh, are, t well, aren't we I don't still know, doing if that? If it's not too late, if it's not too are late, we, we just may uh, open up the uh, the forum out there for people to ask questions. But I, I know you guys are tired because Louise, you just flew in from South Africa like uh, half an hour before you came on the show. So. A little bit jet lagged um, maybe. But anyway, I just want to say thanks for coming here, guys. And again, people can check out ubuntuparty.org.za. Z A. There you go. <laughs> and uh, we're going to just take a break. I don't know if we're coming back or not, but uh, if we're not, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time here on thatchannel.com. Let's, let's, uh, but if we do come back, then you'll see us back here in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.